Hi everybody, it's great to see you here. Thank you so much for coming. We'll get started um, so that we have plenty of time for everybody to ask questions and we can talk to these fine folks. Um, I, I'm not going to take time with you have the program in your bio, but just as a way of introduction, I'm Gary Garrison. I'm the Executive Director of Theater Affairs here at the Guild. This is Michael Roberts, Iris Stark, and Jody Pietro. So would you welcome them with me, please? cell phones or anything that makes noise. Um, please no uh, texting or anything during the event. And when we get to the Q&A, I will be running the Q&A. If when you ask a question, if you could stand up and ask it so everyone in the room can hear it, plus all of our online viewers. Just so you know, we're being broadcast across the country. Um, <laughs> we now have, a, if you don't know this or not, we, we are, the Guild has uh, joined efforts with live, uh, live stream TV. But it essentially puts things like this onto our website and also in conjunction with live scene TV, and that's our members watch it. So folks in here, Peoria and Hawaii and California can see this as well. Um, so this is going to be very, very casual, you guys. As you know, it was called uh, Stories from the Trenches. And so we, we just think it is always so helpful to hear how other folks have worked their way through this maze of craziness that is working in the theater, as I'm sure you know. Um, it's joyous and it's lovely, and it also comes with its own special um, problems sometimes. <laughs> so I'm going to ask some questions. They're going to talk for a little while, and then we'll ask you to ask anything you'd like to. So first, thank you for being with us, you guys. Thank you. Um, for each of you, what was that moment where you said, ah, I belong in the theater? And conversely, what was that moment where you went, oh, I don't know if I belong. <laughs> I can start. Um, I, was an, I was a child actress in Pittsburgh, and I acted at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. And then I was an acting major at, uh, at Carnegie Tech, it was called in, in my day, long ago. And, um, I ha and I'd seen several musicals. I, I came, in those days, they didn't uh, require seat belts, so nine people would get into a little car, and we'd all sit smushed and drive from Pittsburgh to New York, and then second act shows. And so I'd seen a bunch of musicals, and I, I wanted to write one, and I was just telling the guys the story that I was a junior, and a young freshman a composer called me and said he wanted to work with me, and I thought, oh, a freshman. How will he ever know anything? I'm a junior. And, uh, and he said, let's meet. And uh, I said, how will I know you when we meet? And he said, I look like a cross between Ringo Starr and Barbara Streisand. And it was our president, Stephen Schwartz. <laughs> <laughs> so we wrote uh, two shows together while, while we were there. And I, I was always terrified to act. My sister was kind of my mama rose, and she dragged me into the business. And I, and I was... <coughs> never liked acting and I was a terrible actress and um, so it was I had my epiphany about this is for me sitting in the back of the theater and I and they were rehearsing my show and um, the, the wonderful actors did one of my jokes and got a big laugh and I said oh that's great and then she did another one of my jokes and nothing happened I thought Ooh, this is good I can hide in the back that's better to be a writer because I'm not up there and they don't see me with the dying joke so so um, so that was my moment of, of wanting to do it and my moment of not wanting to do it was after I swore to myself I was not going to read Ben Brantley's review of the people in the picture and I didn't but I saw my family's face the next morning faces the next morning and I just said I don't think I want to stay here anymore. I'm going home. But of course, I'm back working on another show, so this goes to show you. Good. Good. Um, I know the moment, I don't know when I felt like I, I belong, but I think I know the moments. The moments that I, that I actually would have quit was when I was first starting out and I had a little show sort of playing around, little, you know, maybe like little basement theaters in New York for a weekend or, or something. And there was always a point for a couple years 
about 15 minutes before the show goes up that I honestly felt if I could get on stage and say, look, I'm sorry you all came here tonight. It's not worthy. I, I will refund all your money. I promise to never write anything ever again. I really had that feeling for about two years, no matter what I did. And then, of course, I, I just sort of, you know, went in the bathroom and threw up or something. But I, uh, but that, but those, those, those probably, if someone actually took me up with that offer, probably couldn't convince me. Shout sure. And I, I, I don't know when I, but I have to say, the moment I got hooked when I was probably about 10 or 11 years old, and my parents took me to see 1776, and the lights came up on the Continental Congress, um, right around the block where the theater was, and I was just hooked. Whatever that theater magic was, I was like, I just remember, I remember where I was, was sitting in the mezzanine, and the lights came up, and I thought, this is for me. I don't know what this is, but this is for me. Mm -hmm. And, and did me. you know you wanted to be a writer at that point, or? Um, I, I always liked to write, like I always kept, like I was like, any writer knows, you know, you're always a writer. Who knows why you're a writer, but you're always a writer. I, I think writers are always a bit step back from society. I think we're just observers by nature. Mm -hmm. So I've always been like that, I, I, you know. Uh, so I didn't know if I wanted to be a writer, but I started writing in high school and, and that sort of pushed it. But I, I don't have the personality to be an actor, so I, I think mm -hmm. writing was just sort of happened. I just, I find my, I find actors are very unguarded. They have great emotional access. And I'm very guarded, so I think that's what makes me a writer. I would never expose myself like that on a stage. And yet, it's interesting that you can tap into whatever that is mm -hmm. that you put the guard up in front of. Yeah. Well, I do. I do it in the privacy of my own home, wearing sweatpants with my dog, and you know, and right. that's when I tap it. I don't tap it, you know. But like, like you, you know, like, <coughs> I'm standing in the back. <laughs> Not my fault. Stand in the back. Right. Michael. Uh, for me, I came to a problem much later than you guys did. My brother, two years younger than me, was from a baby, uh, a musical theater fanatic, an encyclopedia of, of the genre. And uh, I like rock and roll and I like classical. Um, and I would constantly yell at him to turn that crap off and blah, 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 blah. And I slowly realized that, you know, he and I would not fight, but we'd argue about it at night. And I'd say, all this musical theater stuff is crap. I said, except for 1776. And he said, <laughs> and he's like, we all, okay, sorry, we all agree on that. That was the anomaly. That was the one that got through that was actually good. I said, that one and, and company, those two, and then each time it was that one company and this one, that one. And I, and I realized, I realized after a while, the only thing I didn't like was bad musical theater. But you know, the, the good stuff is just stunning. And then for me, because all my training is, classical and all my early work is in rock, all my, like, I, I used to tour um, playing for rock acts. Um, and what happened is I wanted to write something sophisticated. And back in the day, that could still be pop songs mm -hmm. to, you know, Sammy Kahn, whatever. It was just very sophisticated. By the time I came of age, there was no such thing as a sophisticated pop song anymore. So I said, well, what am I going to do being a lyricist and a composer? And it seemed that theater was God bless it, the only place where you can still do that. Sure. You know? Uh, so that was it. That's, so that's how I came to it. It wasn't emotional or visceral. It was, it, was, it was almost a series of choices. The time I feel like I don't belong, um, when my friends who are in television or film make a lot more money than me, that would be it. Other than that, uh, I don't have any regrets. Yeah, sure. So you three represent what I it's, it's fascinating to me, and, and we were so happy that you guys were coming because you represent off-off-Broadway, off-Broadway, Broadway, television, film. So I'm curious how you have seen the, I, I don't mean this to sound as broad as it's going to sound, so let me just say it, and then I'll start it down for you. How you've seen, personally and then professionally, the world of theater change since you got into it. In other words, personally, it's one thing when you have a hit off Broadway or you have a, a, a film or a television show or something on Broadway. Or, I mean, that's a personal journey, but how have you seen that change for you? And how have you seen it change for the rest of the community as well? Jeff? Well, I, the big thing, I think, since I started, which was 15, 20 years ago now, I mean, I started in not not regional off-Broadway, but commercial off-Broadway, and there's no more commercial off-Broadway. I mean, I wrote a show called I Love You and Perfect Now Change, which was four people singing with two musicians, and someone raised $400,000 for it, and, you know, it ran on a small
small weekly nut and it ran for 12 years. Um, and that doesn't exist anymore. That doesn't exist. Even and there'll just be a time where straight plays would ex you know would would go from like Players Horizons or whatever and there'd be success there and move to commercial off early road. And that it just doesn't, the economics aren't there. And that's that's a shame because I mean I had three or four off Broadway commercial productions mm -hmm. of various successes, but you know, I was able to start, I was able to learn and keep learning and meet people and actors and directors and producers, but it, that, that's not there, I mean, that's, which I think is a real, you know. And do you see that primarily as an economic? Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think oddly what happened was 15, 20 years ago, they really, the whole um, I Love New York and the, 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 the Broadway producers got together and branded Broadway mm -hmm. as a great thing, and now, and also what happened with, I think online, there's so many discounts to Broadway shows, it's just as inexpensive to go see a Broadway show now with discounts as to see an off-Broadway show. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's so it, what, what, I, mean, I think there's a bunch of reasons, but any producer will tell you if you're going off Broadway now, you're doing a very simple show, you know, mm -hmm. with you know that with a very low, low, you know, weekly, and, and you know, it's tiny shows, tiny musicals now move to Broadway, mm -hmm. tiny plays, you know, sure, sure. move to Broadway. Where years ago they just would have moved, uh, you know. To bigger house, to, to bigger so, house so, off Broadway, so, and run right. for you know shows. I think like with Strata Jones would have ran for you know a long time off Broadway mm -hmm. two or three years ago. Or no, no, sorry, ten, fifteen years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, even though I'm the oldest one on this panel, maybe even in the room, I am the baby of the group when it comes to writing for the theater because, uh, as we talked about earlier, I've written for television. I've published nine books. And um, I have written in every format. I started out as a joke writer, too. And um, so, and, and my experience wasn't typical because I opened a show, my first musical opened on Broadway. And the reason it did was because uh, the producer went to Donna Murphy, and Donna Murphy has a six-year-old child, and she did not want to leave New York. And luckily for us, Todd Hames wanted to be in business with Donna Murphy, so he read the script and said, okay, this is a good combination. I will do it. I would never do that again. Um, my next show is going to open in Belfast, Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> or can Mars. I, can it's I ask why you would never do it again? Because we didn't have the time that you have had, you know, to, to be, and you have probably had, to, to be elsewhere and to say, oh my God, that, we need a song there. What is that song? Which we actually did do at one point. Uh, Andy Blankenfield, who was the choreographer, came up to me and said, this whole section doesn't work. We were already in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And Mike Stoller, the composer, wasn't even here. I was here by myself. And I ran back to the hotel and called him and said, okay, here's what I think the idea is. And, he came in two days later, and we sat on, at a little keyboard and, and wrote the number. But we really needed that time, even though we had several weeks of previews. It's just not enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, we needed to be able to refine it. So I will say that Roundabout was amazing. Todd Haynes was fabulous to work for, and he was very thoughtful. And, mm -hmm. you know, he really gave us as much preview time as he could. And even canceled the matinee one day when we needed more time, but it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and uh, we needed a commercial producer as well, so uh, we had one, but she was very inexperienced. Mm -hmm. And so, we, uh, I loved the show, and the critics didn't like us, but the audiences loved us, and it was a wonderful experience for me. But I'm a lot smarter now for the next one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael? Um, for me, the way it's changed, uh, when we did Call Up the Musical in 2003, there, you know, I Love You Perp was still going. Um, there was, as Joe said, a, an off-Broadway that was roughly sustainable and had people that went to it. Um, and so that, in its, that was an end in itself. I am producing or I have written a show for off-Broadway and a place off-Broadway. And then it'll get published and whatever. I think the whole purpose of off Broadway's changed now. Uh, when we did Artiste this season, um, although we had every desire to make money and to be a huge smash and run forever, no, we knew that 
to some extent, Off-Broadway is really the world's largest backers audition. It, what it really is is a branding, you know, um, because Off-Broadway itself is a, is a very hard model to sustain. Mm -hmm. Even the word Off-Broadway, you know, I don't know, something smells off, this feels off. <laughs> 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 it's not quite good Broadway. I've heard a bunch of research. Broadway, Off-Broadway used to mean edgy and interesting and yeah. small and different. Right. Now it means not as good as Broadway. Right. 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 That's exactly right. To the average standard. And Off-Off-Broadway actually meant really yeah. experimental and edgy it's and dirty. you had to get on the dirty subway to get to oh, it. Yeah. Could you eat before you got there? It's okay. You bring it in the theater with yeah. you. Yeah. 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 So I, um, this is one of those crazy questions, but if you, if, if we could, this is a fun question too, by the way. If we could just gather all the producers in this country in one room, yeah. and you had their undivided attention for five <laughs> minutes, what might you say to them? You throw a Molotov cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I produced you. Know I did know. <laughs> um, figure out a way to run s small, to have uh, plays and smaller musicals run in New York where they don't have to make $400,000 a week to keep their doors open. Mm -hmm. Like, figure out a way to actually do. Like off Broadway, we like have theaters that we can run off Broadway musicals for six months and not charge a lot and have them be successful and rent plays too. And does it have to be in New York? Can it be? Yeah, of course. Can, not. can it be? Can it be in Chicago? Can it be in Los Angeles or Peoria or wherever it happens to be? Yeah. Is is uh, this is a little tangential question for my mind? But is are we still at the center of the universe here, or is it all over the country? Is good theater made all over the country? In your in your opinion. Of course. Oh, I, I think great theater is made all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. Oftentimes, I, like artistic directors of theaters, seem to look to what's happening in New York, to what they're going to produce, which I'm sure every regional playwright can tell you is very frustrating mm -hmm. and stuff. But I mean, there's great theater and great theater writers anywhere. But you know, also the development process of actually producing writers is so important because you can workshop something to death and you can do readings to death. I mean, actually taking a chance and producing a show in a smaller venue that doesn't have the financial pressure of, uh, you know, of even a big subscription audience. Right. You know. This is actually jumping back to the earlier question, because one of the things that I have seen over the last five years, particularly, are these shows that have a much bigger life, say, in Chicago or right. Los Angeles or Atlanta or yeah. Boston, or whatever it happens to be, and find their way to New York. And we're all surprised. We're like, really? How did that happen? Right. Well, you know what? Yeah. There's great theater being made all over this country. Yeah. Uh, back to the producer's question, Iris or Michael. Say the question again. <laughs> if you could gather, all, if we could gather all yeah, the producers in the room at the same time, and you had five minutes of their uninterrupted time, anything you would say to them? I can. I keep going back to the, to the development process. I think that's what's so wonderful about the theater that it's alive. Mm -hmm. And I mean, believe me, if I could rewrite my novel of Beaches right now, I'd do it. You know, mm -hmm. because I think of things as life moves on and life changes, and I want to be able to have those moments to see actors on stage and to learn from them. I mean, I'm stunned at what the actors bring to it. I'm, I'm thrilled with what they bring to it. Um, we were just working on the script of Beaches the Musical, and I, and I was talking about it with my co-librarist, and I said, let's not tell them what we think they should do here. Let's see what they do, because I'm so curious. And uh, I would tell them, give us more development time, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be here. I don't, I don't care where it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael? Michael, you've been a producer. Yeah, the, the part I was one of the producers on. Yeah. So I've been through the process. What I would, if this room was filled with producers, I would ask what I have asked mm -hmm. producers, uh, and they've, grace, you know, they've very gracefully um, and willingly answered, which is, I was like, what can you tell me? What can you teach me? I think that nowadays, more so than ever, we need to follow some models that exist in other aspects of the entertainment industry. Uh, we were talking earlier, we were talking about um, when uh, Bette Midler has her production company. And every writer, after a while in, in LA, has a, you know, partners with the production company and every celebrity. Is, you know. So I think what they've gotten very quickly and we haven't, is that it's not writers over there, producers over there, 
actors over here. I think that um, writers need to be more proactive, and they need to learn the business, mm -hmm. you know, and that they they need to be entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. So I would ask, I would ask the to answer your question, I would just ask the producers, what can you tell me about my about, uh, ab about what what you know what is the next pile of poop I'm about to step in, mm -hmm. you know, what am I about to do wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, well, speaking of, I mean, it's you know, this is stories from the trenches. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm curious to know if if we can just go back in time, or yesterday, or two mm -hmm. weeks ago, or ten years ago. What's the one thing you wish somebody would have told you that you didn't have to learn the hard way? Oh wow. Well, you know, all the battle scars sort of make you smarter and stronger and better. All those cliches are true. <laughs> like, you know, I've, I've worked with an inexperienced producer once, which I thought was going to be great, and it was a disaster. And then I, you know. And why was it a disaster? If I... uh, because he was inexperienced, and this would be a disaster in any business. He was inexperienced, and he thought he knew everything. And so he didn't listen to people who were experienced. Mm -hmm. Ah, yes. You know, you know, I mean, that. I think we all and, and, and uh -huh. I, I was so happy to be produced. This is also something which I learned. I was so happy to be produced. I was like the young, oh, thank you, thank you for doing everything. So I just sort of went along, even though when I had red flags going on in the back of my head saying, ooh, this doesn't seem, I don't know what I'm doing here, and this doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. And um, I would also say, you know, the one thing which, which I actually wish I did know earlier is you're the writer. You're even if it's a big production, you're an, you an essential, vital part of the process, and you can always speak your mind in any aspect, mm -hmm. and and you have to feel like you've been heard in a way that even if they're not listening to you, at least know. You know, I'm, I, as a writer, I always say that anyone can tell me anything, so I've learned on production, I can tell anyone anything, mm -hmm. even if they're you know, here. It's, it's interesting that you should say that, because I think for all of us, everybody here in the room, we all get, I, I'll just put it on me for a moment, this is what I heard you say as well, Joe, which is I get so caught up in someone else's passion about my art. I'm so, I'm so thankful that somebody <laughs> likes something that I wrote or yeah. loves something yeah. that I wrote, and that I stop, I lose my good sense right. at, at some point. You know, I get caught up in their passion and not, and I'm not paying attention to their experience or, or like you said, all the flags go off, but I just jump Wait. over them. You want to please them because they like you, and the mm -hmm. theater is producing you. So you want to please them, and you know they're, and, you know you have to realize they're not doing you a favor. They think you're talented and you have something to say, and of course they don't want to work with someone who's difficult. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can't. It's your work, and you can't, you know, you can't be a pushover. I mean, I find if you have smart things to say, people generally, not all, generally mm -hmm. like to hear them. Right. But you know, you can't mistake their passion for uh, correctness. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I learned. Yeah, you know, sure. just because they love your work, it doesn't mean they're correct on all the decisions that they make. Sure, sure. Hmm. You go. The thing I learned is I'm going to make this late in life career change stick. I only want to write for the theater now. Because if you are writing a script for film or television and they have changes they want to make, they don't give them to you. They may give you one shot at it, as I told you one producer said to me. But in the end, they'll bring somebody in. I mean, I had TV shows that had my name on them. And if I sat there with a script, I, there was barely anything in it, the show that was aired, that resembled my script. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, that's a nightmare. So mm -hmm. I learned to be in the theater. Sure. <laughs> I don't even know what the question is. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the question, the question, I think I did hear everybody's answer as well. <laughs> <laughs> because the <laughs> members. The question is because this is, you know, uh, stories in the trenches. What is maybe the one thing that you wished you somebody would have told you oh, that you didn't yeah. have to learn the hard way? <laughs> that you never have enough money. I, I hate to sound like such. A, I hate to sound like Jack Welch or something. I really do. It's that. <laughs> it, it's that. Well, we went through this with Fartis. We were uh, lucky to get almost all great reviews, and we had a great show that had won Best Musical at the Fringe, and we had a lot of. Uh, for lack of a better word, mojo going. Mm -hmm. What we didn't have was a reserve. The ticket sales got better and better each week, and just before we thought it was going to be self-sustaining, we ran out of money. Mm -hmm. So that one, uh, and that's again, that's 
it sounds like a producer's lesson, but believe me, it's a writer's lesson too. Whatever you have, it's not enough. You know, there. I'm sorry to be so bleak. No, it's not bleak. Um, you know, there's there have been a lot of people who have been talking about this in the chat rooms and on message boards and on the internet and in magazines and newspapers and, and the like. Um, which is, it feels like as we kind of progress through this line that and this profession that more and more plays and musicals are being written committee style. <clears throat> that, in other words, that you know, you have a play that goes up, or you have a, a musical that goes up, and there are twelve minds that are all working on it, and does the writer get lost in that process? Or can the writer sustain his or her? And who are the 12 other minds? <laughs> directors, writers, actors, choreographers, yeah. dramaturgs, choreographers, you know, that everybody. Yeah, but even, but uh, like, I, 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 like in a, I mean, if you're doing, if you don't want to collaborate, do not write a musical. Because yeah, right. it is the depth, you know, write a novel, write, write a straight, you know, I always say what's the difference between a play and a musical. In a play, when you're in the rehearsal hall, there are just so many less people in the room. Mm -hmm. It's you, it's the director, and the actors. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it. You do a musical, you suddenly have a choreographer, they have an assistant, you have a director, you have a musical director, you have design is more important. It's all collaboration. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if that, um, I, it's my experience that mus musicals haven't been in my case, I've been written by committee, but there's certainly more people giving you input, and there's certainly more people that I have to collaborate with. Mm -hmm. That if a design is bad in a musical, it could derail you, so you <coughs> have to sort of be in sync. Is it easy for the you, Joe, to hold on to yourself as primary in that process with all those, or or is it That's necessary to be primary in that process? It, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it is, but I even mean, think a director in a musical is sort of the general, especially a bigger musical. You know, the general of the ship. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you need a good director who sort of brings everything together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but I mean, the writer. You know, it's like anything. Good, you know, theater. Good writer. You know, you could have the best director, the best <coughs> scenic designer. You have a badly written show. You're, you're the biggest star. You're dead. I mean, it's you know happened many times. So sure. yeah, but if you're lucky, you get to work with smart people who you respect, and they respect you, and you can trade opinions, and then your work sort of gets better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you shouldn't. Yeah, I'm sorry. You shouldn't write. The worst kind of thing rewriting to do is writing just from notes. Like you know, if you don't feel it, and someone's just giving you notes or pressure, mm -hmm. like just to write, you you know, you need to understand it and believe in it to rewrite it. Because I've also been on the pleaser side. Well, I'll just rewrite this because this person is putting a lot of money in my show. Right. Bad idea. Right. Bad right. idea. Right. Yeah. You know um, what they say that a camel is a horse that was made by a committee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's one of the reasons that television is so bad because yeah. so many people get to decide before it goes up. And I, I was just telling the guys a story about Gary Marshall who directed the film of Beaches. And he said to me, when you have a writer, a director, a producer, a studio, and a star, none of you are making the same picture. <laughs> and, and of course, everybody brings their own ideas to it. So I think for me, the answer was I had a wonderful director who I loved, and and we, were, you know, as you know, the theater's a spec business. We worked for years and years together. He became a brother to me, Leonard Folia, who was the director of Masterclass, and I trusted him. And I, and then, and then the rest of the team was Mike Stoller, for God's sake. I mean, he's just the great tinsmith of the world, mm -hmm. and such a sweet, lovely man. Ari Butler, so talented, and then. Who came on board but Paul Gemignani, another fabulous human being, and it was, again, a joy to work with him. And by the way, Paul Gemignani said to me, you can write a better lyric than that, go home and fix it. I knew he was telling me the truth and that I was taking advice from somebody really smart. Mm -hmm. And so I did it. I mean, I think what I'm trying to say is, if, as best one can, surround yourself with people you really believe in. And then when you get advice from them, you'll know to take it to heart. Mm -hmm. That you're not just making something different instead of making it better. Sure. Sure. Oh, about writing by committee and, and collaboration. Um, I don't get a sense yet, at least in the work that I've done, that uh, that we've lost our, as writers, lost our place at the top. Uh, in the in the power structure, uh, 
what I do get a sense of is that um, more, more or less, you tend to try to guess who your audience is, and you write to them, and then that invisible collaborator who you're taking notes from, imagining what their notes would be, you know, saying, ah, I personally don't think that this is funny. I personally don't think this is good. They're going to love this. It doesn't make me laugh, and they're going to love it. <laughs> and, and, and it's always, always wrong. Yeah. Which doesn't mean if it makes you laugh, it'll make them laugh either, but the other way is always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, that that kind of explains all something that Iris said, was, which was that it's absolutely true. It's like this. work with people who you respect, because Paul Giovanni gives you a thought. And, you know, those guys giving you thoughts are smart. And the way, because I've been on the opposite side trying to find those people, is especially when you start with like a director, your sort of primary collaborator on it. First thing, always ask them if they're interested. What do you think of the play? Like, do you love it? Do you think it's pretty good? And conversely, what would you change about it? Right. But don't, don't, particularly early on in our careers, uh, we walk into situations where we're given a director. We don't really have a choice to choose our okay. collaborators. But then you know what? Go out for go out to dinner, have a beer, go say, what do you think of the play? Mm -hmm. What would you change about it? Be honest with them. This is what I think of my play. This is what I'm hoping to achieve. Mm -hmm. You know, what's your vision for it? Um, if you ask those questions, and because I, I was once in a situation where we, it was an off-road musical, we wound up hiring a British director who actually didn't really like the musical and wanted to do a dark, serious thing, and we really wrote a comedy. And it was not fun. And uh, I said, I never asked him what he thought of the play, and he didn't like it. Right. He, did, he was, he was going to make it important, and that was a disaster. But I always ask even, you know, sort of very established people, what do you think it is? Right. I don't need to hear, you know, oh my god, it's the best thing ever, but I need to hear, oh, I really like it, and this is what I hope we can accomplish with it. Well, let's stick on that for a moment. So what happens if you take your director out mm -hmm. to dinner? Or, or an, a lead actor, or right. whoever it happens to be, and you find out they're on the left side of the story, and you're way over on the right side of the story. What would you personally do? Well, I wouldn't ever ask an actor, I, like an actor, because you hire, unless they're a star, which is mm -hmm. a very specific thing. Like an actor, you hire, so you audition them, and you're like, oh yeah, they get what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But a director, if they, if they really, I would say, you know. I would go to the producer or the theater and say, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to, you know, mm -hmm. and, and say what, this is, I'm working on this, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Or talk through that director as much as possible. I mean, it's, you know, it's collaboration, it's communication, but sure, sure. it's usually important, I think. It's such a marriage with yeah. the director. I mean, I, I wrote a very Jewish play, and my agent introduced me to a client of his who's an Italian Catholic, Leonard Folia. Mm -hmm. And I sit down at lunch with him, and he says, those three generations of women, that's my mother, my sister, and my niece. I know them as well as you do. He said, I've seen my mother, I probably shouldn't say this, I think the mother's dead now though, so it's okay. <laughs> I've seen my mother and my sister have arguments over my niece, and I, I've heard the things they've said to each other, and it's all in there, I get it completely, and I thought, Okay, I, I, you know, Italians and Jews are with the same, same people. Mm -hmm. So he gets me and he gets his piece. And he proved to me again and again that I was right mm -hmm. about him. Sure. So. Do you guys ever, I'm sure you might, would, uh, do you have writer's block? And if you do, what do you do to get beyond it? And I know that's a tough question because it happens at different stages for different reasons. Right. But is there anything in particular? Is there something that triggers it for you? Is there something that triggers you out of it? Do you know the early warning sign? Do you not have it at all? Uh, I don't. I don't have writer's block. I have. I don't, I don't describe it. Writer's rust. If I don't. If I don't write for a couple of weeks, like if I'm orchestrating, and you're not using that mental muscle, uh, then you know that the first day of writing, especially lyrics for me. Uh, the first day of writing lyrics are going to be utter horror. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just, you're going to be like, oh my god, I thought I knew how to do this. But that's the only thing for me. If, as long as I can live through that first day of being horrible, I could get to the better stuff usually. Mm -hmm. I, I always give young kids uh, Anne Lamott's book called Bird by Bird. Mm -hmm. uh, talks about writing, and one of the things she says is, allow yourself to write a shitty first draft. 
<laughs> you know, so I just go in the room and I say to myself, this is going to stink, but I don't care, and I just start doing it. And usually it really does. It's pretty bad, but it's okay because if you start, you know, I mean, I, I still write a, long, a lot in longhand, and you just start your hand moving across the page, and something happens eventually. You don't ever find yourself stuck, though, or? I'm, I'm stuck a lot, but I just push on, push just on, push, push through on. It. Yeah. Well, that's what you collaborate is for, too. Mm -hmm. You know, um, especially for the big issues, uh, plotting and form and all that, you know, uh, I know we've all worked with collaborators. Um, when Charlie Shulman and I were working on the Marquis, it would be, you know, he'd walk around the room waving his arms and, you know, saying, but he can't do that, he has to do this, and, you know, I like, well, he has to do this and all that. And that loosens up a lot of what you're thinking. Absolutely. That's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on the Beaches libretto with my friend of over 50 years, a guy I went to college with, a wonderful playwright, Tom Thomas, and he's so thorough and he's so organized, and I am the crazy one in that group. I say, wouldn't it be great if this happened, and then this would happen, and then this would happen, and he kind of pulls me back to earth and, and, <laughs> and lays it all out so that we find out the order all those crazy things are going to happen. But uh, yeah, it is. It's great if you have a collaborator again mm -hmm. that you trust. Mm -hmm. Jeff, uh, two things. I was, I first thing I do, I give myself permission to write badly. Yeah. I'm like, this is going to be bad. The same, exact same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write a draft, and sometimes it's terrible. So, but oftentimes, there's yeah, something the, in there. Yeah, sometimes. and if I'm really mm -hmm. blocked, I mean, I do believe in like getting up, you know, go out, go for, for you know, do something else, get, you right. know, go to, you know, sometimes just a good night's sleep does it. But also, uh, what I always tell young writers, if you're working on something. And you, you you can't write every you're trying to write every day and you can't give yourself make yourself sit in front of the computer or whatever for ten minutes and you can't do anything but write you can't go online you can't do anything ten minutes if you don't write that's fine if you start something that's fine but just sort of give yourself and off you know when I do that it's like a trick plan yourself right well, I'm bored after three minutes I'm gonna try something uh, uh, you know and sometimes it is and you sort of move on but right. oftentimes I'm like oh this is actually leading somewhere. Sure. You know what always works for me? I, I don't know if anybody else does this. As a lyricist, we're always trying to be clever and poetic and mm -hmm. have heightened language and all that. So I'll sit down and write a song, and the first thing that comes into my head are all these clever, or what I perceive as fine to be clever lyrics. And um, at the end of it, when you're getting this jumble, this kind of roadblock stuff, I'm like, oh, what's the song about? What's the song about? And inevitably, the song will be about, you know, grow up, you little whatever. So I'll put oh, as a title of the song, grow up, you little blah blah blah. And I'm like, okay, now I know what the song's about. And it just kind of clarifies the whole thing for you. You know the direction you're going in. Sure, sure. So sometimes it make, not even making it simpler, just saying, wait, what is it that I'm doing? It helps me at least. Well, that a, a wonderful screenplay writer uh, I know, Mark Norman, once said to me, just go back to the character back to the characters, they'll tell you what they want, and that's also very, very true. Do you guys think that you can, because uh, we all have these in our drawers, that you can go back to something that you began 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, or five weeks ago, or or does it, should it stay locked in that time, because there were a lot of circumstances that led you to that moment to start creating that, that song, that lyric, that story, that play, that musical, that whatever. When I was 16, I wrote songs with Michelle Browerman. You know, she, she wrote Dangerous Beauty. We lived in Pittsburgh, and we used to write shows for Jewish organizations, and her mother became our manager, and we'd go around and perform these shows. And she just sent me, coincidentally, four uh, MP3s of four of the songs with a guy that we know singing them. And I loved them. I thought, oh. God, she's sending me this, I'm going to hate them. And I loved them. It was so much fun. Not that I'll ever do anything, but maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, so. I, I think you can go back. Mm -hmm. I think there are certain sparks. It may, you may not go back and say, word for word, I'm going to bring this out. But there may be something in it that you can dig out. Sure. I think, like, if, if it's, I mean, I, it's a big difference between five weeks and 15 years. I mean, but, you know, but 15 years ago, I, like, I, I think what's not good, because you actually mentioned it, which I always think about myself all the time, but Beaches, like I'd like to go back and rewrite it, but in an odd way you can't, because you're a different person. 15 years, you know, two years later, you're, like I, 
like every once in a while, someone say, oh, an early play, could you just fix this? And I was like, and I try and I can't, because I want to redo the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I want to take Joe today, not Joe from 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and, and do it. And I think that's sort of a, a bad thing. But I do think an idea that's like, the thing is if you approach an idea you've had sitting around for 15 years, you're just going to approach it in a different way. You know, if you've never, if you ever really haven't done much with it, and that I think would be more interesting. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there are no rules. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. like sometimes yeah. right, it's it's different. Different. some people take some twenty years to get the you know right. Some people take some a week. So, yeah. uh, about old material. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I've tried to pull certain songs out of the trunk and insert them into something else. It's I don't know if it's obvious to everybody else. It's always obvious to me, and I do think they have. What nicely could be called a patina, but more likely would be called a stench to them. They're just, they're, no, really, they do. They do because you're younger and you're not yeah. as polished. You're not. You're not as good. One thing you are is more adventurous. Uh, adventurous, and you're you're a little bit wilder. You're like, oh my god, why did I? Yeah, you're spon exactly. You're spontaneous because you haven't, you know, no learned what that. works. <laughs> so that's good, but that's different. That's you can take a lesson from that, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that this. In that thing you wrote when you were 14 is really the way to go. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in moving on. You don't right. want to draft. If it doesn't right. work, move on. Right. I don't think we're going to be seeing the shows I wrote this year in yeah. Schwartz and Carnegie. Right. <laughs> but that's, that's the good thing. I'm sorry. The, 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 the only thing I will say is because I didn't start, I didn't even think about writing a musical until I was 32 or so. So um, I learned so much about music and about many things before I first wrote anything mm -hmm. that I have the luxury of not having to look at those things I wrote when I was 18. You know what I'm saying? Right. So uh, I, it would be very, when I do have early stuff though, it's just not as good. Sure. This is my last question and it's, uh, um, uh, here it goes. So you know, before you guys had whatever whatever you consider to be your success in this, there were there were perhaps and I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know your careers intimately. There could have been long stretches of time, or it could have been five years or five weeks or whatever. Again, so for for all of us who are waiting for that thing to kick for us, how do how do you how did you sustain yourself, or how do you sustain yourself now? Waiting for the next thing to come along, because it's a time. It's sometimes it can be a real, you know, writing is a solo sport. Mm -hmm. You by yourself, and then trying to push a, a career up a hill is sometimes tough. Mm -hmm. right. I, I think it always has to come to the writing. Like you have to have joy in the actual act of writing, and if you don't, don't be a writer. And then, you know, because it's just too frustrating. It's too lonely. The rewards are too slim. It's you, you get rejected many, many, no matter who you are, many, many more times than right. you get succeed. So you, you need to find joy in the writing, and you need to find. And I also, I, I, I think if I've had any success, it's because I love it, love it, love it. I don't always love the business of it, but I love sort of. And I, I, I have writer's block. I have all those things, but when it's working, it's just yeah. phenomenal for me. And I always keep educating myself. I'm a lifelong student of literature and theater. Mm -hmm. And I always try to get better. That's you know I had a um, I had a one show uh, it was called uh, called Osha Gap on Broadway several years ago. Now Big Elvis musical, but that was going to be big. And I thought this is my thing. This is it. And it wasn't. And, I, <laughs> and it was you know it's, it's devastating. It's so depressing. And I thought well everyone what everyone expects me now is to sort of go lick my wounds and write alone one thing for two years. I said, I'm going to do it. And I had a, some dark, dark nights and things. Mm -hmm. But after a while, I said, you know what? I am going to double down and write twice as much and write different things and really try to take that master class I had in writing a big musical and figure out what I can do next. Sure. And I spent really two years where no one was that interested in my work. You know, but just writing, 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 and finding pleasure in that, and, and just trying to get better. Right. And then I suddenly had all these things that suddenly started getting done. But it was only because I, you know, because because I, as I said, I, because I consider myself a lifelong student of, of, of theater literature. It's so interesting that you say that, Joe, because you know I I have a, a dear friend who had a show open here recently in New York, and it's been a long time coming for him. Mm -hmm. 
And part of the reason why it's been a long time coming is, is my, this is my sense, is that my sense is that he doesn't really enjoy writing. Yeah. But he enjoys having written. Mm. Well, yeah. and, and there's a huge difference oh, yeah. in that. Because you're waiting for that carrot, that opportunity, that phone call, that letter, yeah. that whatever it happens to be. I mean, obviously he likes writing, but I don't think mm -hmm. he loves it and that he's doing it to enlighten his life regardless of whether or not it's produced or, and I could be talking to myself, by the way, whether it's produced or not produced as well. Right. You guys? I, uh, one of the things that I was, made me so happy about giving up acting, not that anyone noticed, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and, <laughs> and turning to writing was that I, the other thing I realized, uh, aside from the fact that uh, that I was better at it than I was at acting, was that I could do it every day. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to wait for someone to call me to audition or you know, I wasn't up for something. And I, and I love that, and I do, and I, you know, I, people say to me, oh, you're so disciplined, and I say, no, I'm not disciplined, I just don't do anything else. I don't have any hobbies, I don't play golf, I don't play tennis, I can't cook, my husband cooks every night <laughs> in our house, thank God, or he'd starve to death, and, um, and it's what I love to do, and I think that's the answer. You better love the process. I was just at Carnegie Mellon, it's called now, and I was talking to the playwriting workshops, and I said, I can't say this on, on camera, I said, you better effing want it, because that's what gets you there. The guy getting off the bus after you may have more talent, but if you want it more, you'll keep doing it, you'll keep doing it, and eventually something will happen. Mm -hmm. Told that to them, and I'm telling it to you. <laughs> no, no, you know, it's interesting because you know, I, I, ultimately I write for myself. I mean, really, that's who I write for. Because it's, you know, I've got to salve my wound, I have to make myself laugh, I have to make myself cry to get that kind of, you know, shit out of it. And I, there, I do it really, really for me. But it's just, you know, after your 10th year of doing that, or whatever it happens to be, it's just hard to push that rock up that hill. The people in the picture. I remember, actually started with a call to me from Bette Midler, who said, Iris, write me a musical. And, I, and, I rem and the reason I remember the year was I was traveling with my daughter, who was born in 1985, and she was, we were celebrating her 10th birthday. She's turning 27 in June. So people in the picture took me 15 years to make happen. So. You know, you just know. keep going. Sure, you uh, For me, what sustains me <laughs> is that, oh, I, I don't know, I think it's the realization that the world, mm -hmm. and I can only speak for musical theater by and large, the musical theater world we live in, uh, a project has a gestation period that is infinitely longer than it used to have. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you just can't go back and look at the theatrical index from 1962 and say, boy, uh, yeah, had a show last year and he has a show this year. It's not, it's not that anymore. Uh, it, it can't work that way financially. It can't work that way in terms of bureaucracy and infra infrastructure. Because you know, back then, of course, you had one or two producers who said, I'm going to do this. They assembled the team and they just did it. Now everything seems to be, it has tentacles in different places. You have to get approvals in many different, in many different places. Which is one reason why I went to produce it, because I wanted to at least be one of those guys who keeps the ball moving forward. You know, so. I lied. I actually have one other quick question, which is because we talked about this in my office, and I just want okay. to share it with everybody. With, uh, what what have you seen recently that just knocked your socks off? Because then it doesn't have to be in the, you know it can be anywhere in this country, anywhere, anywhere. What have you seen, and that you're really excited about that you can't wait for the rest of the world? I love Jesus Christ Superstar, I was telling you, just because I have only seen one other production. I, I always love that music. I saw one other production, I thought, oh, this is a bad show. And they're good music, bad show. And then I saw the, the new one on Broadway, and I was watching it, realizing I know every lyric to this show, I didn't realize it. And I thought it was just rock and roll theatrical excitement. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps it's not the most um, uh, uh, clearest way of telling that story. But I knew the story, so I was fine, and I just thought it was musically uh, thrilling. Great. I saw 4,000 Miles yesterday, and I loved it. 
as I said to Gary, maybe it's because I'm a grandmother and I fantasize that my grandson will show up at my door someday. But I think what I loved about it was that it was so real and it was so touching, and I felt as if I was peeking in someone's window watching their story. And it, just, it was a wonderful lesson in writing, I thought, from a wonderful young writer, which was great. I, I, I've been orchestrating, so I, it's horrible to say. I'm so embarrassed. I've seen nothing. <laughs> I've, I've seen, I, I, you know, and I wish I could get out. I mean, I live in the city. I wish I could just go out more. Um, I mean, of course, you know, I saw Porky and Bess, and it's just, I mean, you know, when, when Bartiste was running, uh, we were on 45th Street, so next door was Adam's family. Down the street was Porky and Bess, and across the street was Follies. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, screw it. Just <laughs> why am I even trying? But, you know, um, the, the Porky and Bess is just breathtaking. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I'm, it, I just kind of combining a lot of story, uh, things that we've shared today, but I saw Adam's family on Broadway. And then, you know, those guys took it down and they reworked it and they put it up before they took it out on the road. And uh, a good friend of mine is in the show. And I went to see him in the show in Hartford. And it's crazy different. Oh, that's good. It's, yeah. um, it's amazing. It's, first off, it was just kind of fascinating to, to have seen it on Broadway and then to see it out on the road somewhere. And I did, you know, I expected to see what I saw a year ago. And to know that they had reworked that show and, and but really reworked it in a way that you kind of always wish that you probably could. You know, to clarify story or songs or character or intention or whatever it happens to be. I was really kind of blown away from the experience of it. It was it was kind of extraordinary. Further to my point about the theater being alive, that's mm -hmm. really thrilling about right. it. You get to do that. But you know, so often those shows come down off of their runs, wherever they happen to be, Broadway, mm -hmm. off Broadway, off off Broadway, where they happens to be, the fringe. They're picked up, they're pushed into the universe, and there's just, again, there's just not that time, because they want to get them out while the name is still the name, or the people are still the people, or whatever it happens to be. And this was a real case, I have to say, oh, nice. for taking a Great serious day. look at what yeah. you learned in the run of that show before you put it back out into the universe. It was kind of extraordinary, I have to say. Um, hey, you guys. So I just feel like we've been in the living room. Would y'all like to come on in? <laughs> Is there something that you would like to know? I mean, what would, you, what would, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask these fine folks about any, anything? Well, not a question, but I just want to encourage everyone to go to once. Oh, um, yeah. You know, uh, I, that's what I was blown away by at New York Theater Workshop. And I think it's, it's pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Why well, do a question I can ask? Please. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, uh, back to your question about producers and get your pro all these producers mm -hmm. in the room. Um, I'd like to know if you're curious about what I'd be curious to ask them is what they think of rolling premieres and how this might help all the previews. Premier. Previews, what does that mean? premieres. Where they, they, you mean where they keep the previews going for weeks yes. and weeks and weeks? Yes. Uh -huh. Which w is a terrific thing for all of the playwrights um, uh, who can't get a second production. But it, it depends. Like a Broadway, because a Broadway preview period is four weeks. Yeah. So and you need to have your act together before you get there. You I'm not like talking about Broadway. Broadway. I'm yeah. not talking about Broadway. Actually, I, mean, like, I think she's saying rolling premieres, which yes. is oh, sorry. Yeah, Did premieres. I say preview? No, yeah. I did. I'm sorry. So it premieres, yeah. really it premieres here or it premieres in, at Luna Stage in New Jersey, mm -hmm. for example. But at the same time, it's it's opening in Luna Stage. There are other there are five other premieres that are slotted out away from it of the same show. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I would I would talk to those producers and encourage more of that, mm -hmm. um, as yeah. well as more co-production. Right. You yeah. see a little bit of now, but yeah. not so much. Yeah, the good thing about co-productions is it gives you a chance to see your work produced by good people from front of an audience, and then hopefully you get a chance to work on it before the next leg of it. I mean, the best of me co-productions are, you know, it happens one month, and then you actually have, go and rehearse a little bit more, and you actually have a little time to sort of, you know, get into a place. I, I don't even know what's happening. Yeah, I'm just going to Like, like <laughs> two theaters do it, two different theaters. So oh. it starts in theater A, 
and then when the same city. cast and right. set goes uh -huh. to the next oh, city. So, and so sometimes they give you a little time to. So Center Theater Group. Right. And then right. Yeah, does it. Yeah, yeah. 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 that sounds great. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. What is to deal with the, the economy? Mm -hmm. Is what I'm thinking. Sure. Sure. Mm. Yes, sir. How do you pick your projects? Do you find you have several in your back pocket you're willing to do, or do you wait until you finish one and then? I generally have several lines, like the, there's, there's a play I've been meaning to write for a long time and I'm just waiting until I get done with what I'm doing now to really do it. So, but, but I find that I need to have something in me and to think about it for a long time. And I have, and I have to want to, want to, can't wait to write it. I, I hate start, I would start something, I don't know if I really like this idea. Like I have to want to write at least and explore what it is. But this is me. Well, as I mentioned, for me, um, you know, I, I started out in the theater. I was, uh, I, I majored in acting and wrote the varsity show, and then I moved out to LA for what I thought was the summer and stayed there for 25 years. So I always say I took a wrong turn at Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the musical started for me when Beth Midler called me and I decided that I really wanted to go back to my first love, which was musical theater. And I grew up in a household where they spoke more Yiddish than English, and, I was, and I'm madly in love with the Yiddish uh, language because I feel as if it's it's why the Jewish people have survived because it's so fraught with humor, and um, so uh, I decided that was the right project for her because I, I started watching these Yiddish films, and they did what she does, which is turn your emotions on a dime. One minute you're laughing, one minute then the next you're crying. So. So that uh, and so I wanted to write about that, and I couldn't have put the 15 years in. Believe me, if I didn't love, love, love that project. And then somewhere along the line, a friend said to me, "Why don't you do Beaches as a musical? It's such a perfect musical because the main character is a singer." And I said, "Oh yeah, that's an interesting idea." And I pulled out my contract with Disney from 1984, and as it turned out, in those days the studios weren't yet. Uh, rating their catalogs to see what they could turn into musicals, and I owned the stage rights. And I did a little dance around my office. And said, oh, that's my next project. Uh, but, it, but it really has to be something that I'm passionate about. And my next project after this is going to be about Jerry Mulligan, the late jazz saxophone player, who was a close personal friend of mine, and a certain amount of time in his life when his life intersected with Judy Holliday's. And so, you know, because I feel so passionate about that, I agree. You have to really be turned on. Otherwise, you don't want to go sit in that right. room all day. <laughs> Joe, I know you have nice work that you can get at. You're working on beaches. And Michael, you're working on? Uh, we had a show, uh, Charlie Shulman and I, called My American Family, which is now called Tell Me All. We were doing it down in American University. And right now, I mean, uh, that's the next thing coming up. I really can't tell when. Uh, because we're working on the British production of the Far Keys, the West End production of the Far Keys, which is coming in next season. So uh, I, I'd be kind of foolish to turn my attention away from that. Yes, sure. Sure. yes sir. Um, I'm just wondering if, if agents were important in the development of your careers or if you basically had to hustle yourselves and they just sort of negotiate contracts. <laughs> You're, you, like, I have a really good, like a great agent. And I find you have to always, it's always about you, you know, I don't know anyone who has a complaint about their agent, so it's always about you, right? I mean, it's always about you getting it out there, meeting people, you know, going to theaters, figuring out what type of show they like, see if, you, if you're writing a play that matches, but I think at the end of the day, agents are helpful at a certain extent, but, you know, I bet I've got, I've gotten so many productions of my shows from having, from other plays I've written, is some like a theater producing and saying, oh, we like that. Do you have something else? You know, that, that's just been my experience. You you always are selling yourself, no matter you know. Maybe Stephen Sondheim does, but everyone else sort of has to. Remembering too that you have uh, if, if, if your show gets picked up by a publisher, you have a publisher yeah. who, in essence, is really what you want. You want more productions of your work. So with golf, uh, which is with Samuel French, you know, they, I don't know how much they. Pushed it, but I mean, there's been over 50 productions, and it's been in other languages, and blah, blah, blah. And so I have to certainly give them credit for putting it out there into the world. 
And so for me, that relationship is infinitely more important than any relationship I've had with an agent. I just want to respond to tell you that I, you know, um, I, when I first started out, I was with William Morris and they dropped me as a client after about three years of being with William Morris and then I got picked up by somebody else and somebody else and I jumped over and then she died and you know, yeah. it's just like, uh, I had Fifi Oscar who was an extraordinary woman but she passed away. And so I've had them and I've not had them, by the way, and I just want to echo what these guys have said, which is nobody works harder for me than, than me. And, and uh, because it's, it's no, I cannot make it in, as important to anybody but myself than <coughs> myself. So, and then if I find that I'm in trouble or I need help or whatever, there's the guild and there's an entertainment lawyer if it really comes down to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, because I think we use the agent thing as reasons why we can't get, sometimes, mm -hmm. I have used it as I can't get somewhere because I don't have an agent. Mm -hmm. I just don't know that that's true anymore in this day and age. It's, can I get into Hartford stage? No. But believe you me, there are plenty of other places in the country that will read your work that are not Hartford stage. Yes. Uh, yes. I was curious, since some of you, if not maybe all of you, came into the theater portion of it not straight out of college, working as a composer or as a novelist, and um, other than getting a phone call from Ben Midler, is there, what were some of the ways that you, you know, really, uh, you know, not being the college intern, getting into it, like how did you come in cold? It's very curious about that. I, I, I think I have what at least to me is an interesting story. Um, my brother, who I mentioned earlier, he and I are very close, he worked um, for who at that time was Rupert Holmes manager. And he worked in the office, it was his, one of his first jobs out of school. And he said, oh, you have to come meet Rupert one day. You guys have the same synthesizer. And this is long, long ago enough where, you know, that was like, you know, that was really a bonding thing. And, um, because you'd say, well, how come now you do this and all that? Anyway, so I think it's when Solitary uh, Confinement was playing with Stacey Keach that um, my brother said, oh, you've got to come meet Rupert. And of course, I think Drew, which is coming back to you, hooray. Uh, is just one of the most stunning scores ever. It's, it's genius. Anyway, so I was very excited to meet Rupert. So I went to meet him, and we talked for a couple minutes about the Korg M1, uh, which is a synthesizer. And then um, we were very loosely in touch. Uh, and then I remember that his assistant, uh, <coughs> I got married and left uh, to go to LA. And uh, so I wrote to him and I said, look, uh, you know I'm a fan, you know I'm a nice guy, I would love to help you in any way, uh, you know, and he being such an incredibly nice person, said sure, come on up, let's talk about it. And so I worked with, uh, that's, I got to know him, and now not every, I can't imagine everybody's as giving and generous as him, but I worked four years writing music for the TV show I Remember When that he created. We did a Dennis Leary film together. Um, Mostly him, but me, you know, picking up, you know, uh, what I could do. And so I did come at it in a strange way that I couldn't have done. I had already had a career by then, mostly uh, touring as a, a, a rock musician. Uh, and so I had, I was making a living already. Uh, but that was my entree into something like that. He, I think he saw me as someone who wasn't that green, who actually had a little experience. Um, well, I, uh, again, I dropped out of acting. Here we go again with me dropping out of acting. And, um, and then I start, I wrote a bunch of spec scripts and I knew an agent and, um, and he got the spec script to George Slaughter, who was then the producer of Latvian, and he hired me as one of a whole staff. It was the 70s and he hired me as, as one of a whole staff of women writers. He was trying to kind of jump on the feminist bandwagon and he would be the executive producer. And so I was one of half a dozen writers and um, and the stars of the, it was called The Shape of Things. It was a, just a one-off kind of a special and it was 
uh, Phyllis Diller, Brenda Vaccaro, Joan Rivers, uh, Lee Grant, um, and, and the choreographer was a woman, and the, and the uh, producer, the director. At any rate, I wrote a song, uh, lyrics to a song with Marvin Laird, uh, and it was uh, about a Jewish girl who falls in love with Henry Kissinger. <laughs> and it was called Oh Henry, and uh, uh, George, Wait. Bless you. Bless you. <laughs> George Slaughter loved the uh, song, and uh, the show didn't go anywhere. We just did the one special, and uh, he called and said, I'm about to produce three, they used to call them specials, I don't know what they call them now. He said, one for Doris Day, one for Diana Ross, and one for Cher. Which one are you interested in? And I, I used to watch the old Sonny and Cher show all the time, and I loved her. I just thought she was fabulous. So I said, I want Cher. So he said, you got it. This, you know, and so this Asian friend of mine made a deal. And it was a special. It was right when Sonny and Cher broke up. He did his TV show, and then she did hers. And I worked on her first one, and it was, um, uh, it, the cast was Bette Midler, Elton John, and Flip Wilson, and uh, Cher. It was, it was, and I was the only woman in the room. And it was 1974 or five, and, and believe me, those men did not want me in that room. Yeah. And they and they smoked cigars and they talked dirty and I loved every minute. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't get rid of me. I just thought it was so great. In fact, I, I would come home and I'd say, "They're paying me to do this. I can't believe it. I would do it for free. I loved it so much." And I really learned under fire. And then what happened was uh, after the second year, suddenly um, Cher fired everyone and she just kind of disappeared for a few weeks, and the guys were terrified of her. They used to push me into her dressing room and say, find out what she'll talk about. And she'd say, this script sucks, and she'd throw it across the room, and so they were terrified of her. And since I was the only girl, they would send me in there, and she would tell me what she wanted to talk about. So she fired everyone, and she disappeared. No one knew where she was, and the guys made a little miniature golf course that went through all the offices. And I wrote a Cheek on the Man episode while I was waiting, and this shows you how far back it goes. And uh, one day she called me, and I said, what's going on? And she said, I'm firing everyone but you and Bob Mackey and Earl Brown. And Earl Brown was the guy who wrote the special material. And so it was, it was a surrealistic experience. I went back to work, and everyone was gone, from the executive producer down to the coffee girl, uh, except for me, Bob Mackey, and Earl Brown. And then they brought in a whole new staff, and we started again. And she went back with Sonny on TV. So for two years, while she was pregnant with Greg Allman's baby, <laughs> she was on TV with Sonny, and I was writing the opening dialogue and the character, Laverne Lashinsky, the lady of the laundromat. So, <laughs> so anyway, that, so, so that was how I got a foothold in television. I was writing a lot of episodes, and it was, I mean, it's what I said before about the camel. It was so collaborative, it just drove me nuts. So I finally just said, I think I'll write a novel. And I sat down and I wrote three chapters and an outline of a book about two little girls who meet in Atlantic City and it follows their friendship over 35 years. And I sent it to my TV agent. He said, I don't do novels. I'll send it to somebody in New York. And the agent called me and she said, they like the writing, but they say it's not commercial. Who cares about two little girls who start on the beach in Atlantic City? Can you, do you have any ideas that are commercial? And I said, well, my first husband was in the mail room at MCA Universal, and all the guys in his studio mail room class, if you will, became very famous. And they said, oh, that's the one. Write that one. <laughs> so, I, so I sat down, and in 10 months, I wrote a very trashy novel called The Boys in the Mail Room. And it was a dual main selection of the Literary Guild, and it was a New York Times list, and it was uh, Aaron Spelling bought it as a miniseries, and then everyone said, Remember that book about the two little girls? It's such a great idea. Yeah. So it just was my second novel. And then, you know, then I had a, a son, and then I was divorced, and then, you know, so I decided the novel business is a good business for a mom, and I'll just stay home in my room and do that for a while. So I did. I wrote uh, nine books. And uh, in the meantime, I all, and one of them was Beaches, and then it was, you know, it was made into a film. That's how I knew Bette, and that was what caused her to call me. Probably what she meant was write another novel, and then 
and someone else will make it into a movie. But I, this was my big chance to go back into the theater where I was born. So I said, okay, I'm doing it. And of course, by the time it got finished, she was too old to play the part. <laughs> I didn't mean that bad. If you're watching this video, <laughs> you're adorable. You look so young. <laughs> At any rate, um, so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but you actually know how I started, which by sort of totally cold. I went to Rutgers College. I was an English major. I graduated. I wanted to have this idea of be a writer. I said I got to eat, so I got a job like as an assistant in advertising. And I was there for about ten years, and I wrote at night, and no one cared. And then, but I literally wanted to write. I would write, and I would tell friends about it. And a friend of mine was. You know, sort of in this like you can't plan this stuff, like a union organizer who had a friend who was a political cartoonist who was doing a late night cabaret show and looking for writers in this little theater on 45th Street or something. And so I just like volunteered and I went in and I like showed them some stuff and I realized, oh, I was the one who was actually writing funny. I, I could write funny, which I didn't really know until I like, heard people read it out loud. <laughs> and then I thought, huh, you know what? I'm going to like see if I can get my own like little sketch comedy done. This little theater. So I went to um, the West Bank Cafe is still there. Mm -hmm. And a guy named Lou Black, who used to be, he's a comedian now on TV, oh, yeah. he used to run that place. Yeah. And this was before, this was like 98, it was before the internet, and I was very shy. And I would literally go to him and I would like leave notes for him because I didn't want him to be there. It was like calling someone up and hoping they're not there. <laughs> so I would leave these like little notes. Hi, Mr. Black. Because he had seen my work and said, oh, that's funny. Like, you know, very just like offhand comment. And then I just bugged him for six months and he finally gave me this little evening. And then I, you know, gave me a couple more. And then I, I essentially, what's great about New York or sort of any city is that there are a lot of aspiring writers, directors, and actors. And I essentially just hooked up with them, started doing these little shows, and I learned how to write. I mean, I, I was like just sort of this master class in writing. And then I wrote, um, so I really started with no connection. I, I wish I had gone. I was, God, people went to Yale are so lucky because they, you know, you're Wendy Wasser, Zeta, and Chris Durang, we're out having drinks. And, like, oh, why was that me? I could, I'm almost that old. I could have been hanging out with them. But, uh, but it, was not, it was not me. And so, but I just sort of persisted. And as I keep saying, I kept getting better. I kept doing these little productions and I worked really hard on them. And, um, and then I wrote a play, like I wrote one play that was terrible, put into draw, wrote another play and sent it out everywhere, and the O'Neill Center, which I think is still there, yeah. picked it up. And then suddenly I have just a little more interest, mm -hmm. and I used that interest to write something else, and I got a reading here, and then I didn't produce it, but I think they were interested in something else. So it was just like starting, start like starts, you know, you said there's a lot of theaters beside Hartford Stage. You can start small mm -hmm. in smaller places and keep pushing it, and that's just what I did. And I kept, I kept pushing it, and I kept getting better. I think those were the two keys. They did quit your job. I quit, I quit my job 12 years later after the story yes. started. So it seems like, oh, yes. But no, it was literally, I was, I was like 32, 33, when I, yeah, yeah. And I really quit it for like thinking, oh, because I started getting a couple things here and I felt like I'm just going to, now, because I didn't have a family, I was third, early 30s. I'm like, I can, I don't have a mortgage, I can actually do this. And I'll do freelance advertising in a year from now. I'll, it doesn't work out, I'll come back. But I just, I sort of wanted too much. I just sort of somehow figured out how to, how to you know, earn a living. Um, one thing that, that's really was made it a little bit easier for me. I don't know if it's been easy for anybody. <laughs> is that you know I was a fairly well accepted in New York as a pianist and a music director. You know, I mean, I could make a living from it. And so you know, all, you meet all the producers, you meet all the directors. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. You, if there's something else, you yeah. know, if you can approach that from the side, sometimes yeah. that's good. That, that's totally what happened with golf. Is that I was um, I was at the John Houseman Theater. Oh yeah, we used to be there, Forty Second Street, right? Great John Houseman. Yeah, the Great John Houseman yeah. Theater, and um, I was the pianist in Capital Steps, and uh, Eric Krebs, amazing, wonderful producer, um, owned the the Fairbanks mm -hmm. and the and the um, Houseman at the time. Would come backstage, and he was always the kind of guy, still is. Who, if he had an omelet for breakfast and saw you in the stairwell, would be like, omelet, could that be a show? And, uh, <laughs> and, and we'd all be like, well, geez, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, and um, so, so uh, which is my way of saying omelet the musical in the opera. Uh, you know, which, <laughs> 
Anybody who wants that idea, please. It's all you want. Um, the, and he would come backstage, you know, he's just such a gregarious guy. And he, he would say, you know, golf, there should be a musical about golf. And I, I love sports, but I really didn't play golf. But I was like, oh, that sounds horrible. That sounds like a horrible idea. But, you know, he liked it. And again, he's a producer. So I hadn't had a show produced, really. And so I was like, I will write a show about golf. And, you know, and so, but that was the thing. But Eric and I would have never known each other if I wasn't a pianist in his stable of talent, something like that. So if you could get to know people, especially in New York, my gosh, we all live in New York. Uh, if there's a way you could just get to know people so you're not a stranger, you know? I, I hate to go back to network, 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 because it sounds so cheesy, cheesy and, and <laughs> underhanded, but it's, what business isn't about networking? Every business is about networking. Right. Yeah. But you know, it's, I mean, I'm so glad that you said that because you know, it's, it's one of the things that I, because I'm asked this all the time about how to, how to, how, how, how to get started or whatever it happens to be. And you know, I, I feel, because I, you know, I think about dating and uh, there have been times in, in my life, and I'm sure yours, that we've been single or not. But you know, if you go on a date and you're sitting in front of somebody who's just like, wants something, from, you don't know what it is, they just want something from you, or they say what they want from you. It's always uncomfortable to me, as opposed to, let's have a nice date. Will you tell me a little bit about yourself? I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. What can you bring to the table? What do I bring to the table? You know, as writers, we're often in a position where our hands are out. What can you give me? As opposed to, what, what can we give each other? Right. You know, how can we date each other? How, what, what do I have that you like, and what do you have that I like? Exactly. When, when I used to tour in the, in, in the rock business, I might have been out with Leslie Gore, I remember not with Christie, I don't remember who I was out with, but I had just started. And uh, the music director, who's still a good friend of mine, you know, I, I was like, well, you know, this is fun. We're going around, we're playing rock and roll, this is all great. How do you, you know, but you're the music director. You know, how do you, what's the most important thing? I'm like, am I playing, am I studying the charts enough? And, and he said, be a good hang. Be someone people want to be around, you know? I'm still working on that, but you know, I think it's, I think it's important. No, no, no. I, I think so. I think that was really important because if there was ever business where it's about, I like you, I like this person, I don't like that person, right. it's this one. Right. Yeah. Any more questions, you guys? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, I have a question. Um, thank you very much. It's been like really fabulous. Uh, this gentleman here, I forget your name. I'm sorry. I'm Joe Duke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Michael Roberts. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, anyway, you said. <laughs> <laughs> sure I guess I'm it. sorry too. Uh, you said make sure you don't run out of money. That's one of the things you said. How do you do that? Uh, well, yeah, I, should be, I should be clear. I should be clear. I was talking as uh, wearing my producer hat that, um, and even as a writer, when I, other people have produced me, you get, you glean enough of what's going on to know how important reserved money is. Here's the thing, and this is just my opinion, and I'm not that experienced. It sounds like I am, but I'm really not, you know? But I have produced off-Broadway, so I can say this, is that we live in the richest city in the world. There is money out there, you just have to ask for it. And if you think that your script gets rejected a lot, go ask people for $6,000 for a point. You know, then you'll find out. You know, But we've already steeled ourselves that way by being writers. We're, or, or we're just like, I know I'm gonna go out and get rejected 50 million times, but you know, there are enough people there where it's a numbers game where people will give you money. Um, so uh, the way to do it is to go, what, what I did is I hired an amazing GM, uh, Laura Heller, uh, first, and I said, this show is going to cost $200,000 because I did my homework. And they just laughed and laughed and laughed at me. <laughs> and um, so we doubled, essentially doubled that budget. And um, that's where I learned that you, you, the money just goes no matter how savvy you think you are. But that's really a production, I, I don't know, even know if I should have brought that up, because that's really a production thing, not a writer thing. Mm -hmm. 
We're going to have to end, but before I do, first off, I want to thank uh, Mike and Iris and Joe. And also, if you don't know, this is Seth Cutterman, by the way, who works at the office. He's the director of our online services, and also Terry Stratton back here, who's the director of our operations. And it's because of Terry that these events happen. So thank you, Miss Stratton, very, very much. Thank you guys very much. And it was lovely to see you all. Thanks so much.